right guys, welcome back to Revive School. Yep, we have a new backdrop, we have a new painting, we have a new book of the Bible. We're studying the Gospel of Matthew, the good news about Jesus Christ throughout the book of Matthew. Matthew written by a man named Matthew, written by a man named Levi. Same guy, tax collector. He decides to follow Jesus. He's one of the 12. And in the first two chapters, I love what he's doing because you can, based on Minnie's painting, he's painting a picture of Jesus' family tree. He says, hey, this is all who are involved with Jesus and the genealogy, the lineage of Jesus. And oh, by the way, our one word, this is really, really important for uh, Matthew 3 today, is that you are going to see, remember in Matthew 2, the, the wise men come and say, hey, where is the king of the Jews? Well, now we're going to get into Matthew 3, where then there's a guy coming and he's beginning to announce and prepare the way for the king of the Jews. So you have somebody looking for him and now you have somebody announcing, hey, here he comes. And so I want to just unpack what that looks like, when, when you think of the word, this guy that's doing an announcement, the guy that's the forerunner, okay? Now, when I think of a forerunner, I think of a car. I think of a vehicle. But what John Walvard says about a forerunner is this, a couple definitions, I think this is cool, because remember, if there's somebody coming ahead of the king, he's announcing the king, he is the forerunner, and this is what their role is, is that when a king would visit a town, his servants would go before him to announce his visit. Hey, by the way, the king is, is coming. And they want to make sure that the town was in good condition to receive him. Sometimes, I think this is an interesting, I, I never knew this. Sometimes the servant, the forerunner, was asked to do minor road work to actually smooth the road for the king to come in. So it wasn't just about announcing, it was actually physically preparing the way for the king. And that's what you're going to see in Matthew 3 all throughout this chapter with a man named John the Baptist. In verse one, it says, in those days, John the Baptist came and he was preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Now, I don't know about you guys, but it seems to me like John the Baptist doesn't have a really good PR guy. <laughs> like if you're going to go in and announce the king and prepare the way, I want to show you something here. This is our great map that we have here. This is the Salt Sea, also known as the Dead Sea. And right to um, the west of it, right? <laughs> Sorry. The west of the Dead Sea is the wilderness of Judea. Now, if you're going to announce that the king is coming, why would you go to a wilderness? Oh, I wonder if there's a person here today. But that's really what John the Baptist does. And I, I think that's an absolutely, it's how the Lord designed this whole thing. Kevin, if you would, would you go to 1 Corinthians 1, 26? I want to use these couple verses in Corinthians that Paul writes about as the mentality of who John the Baptist is and how he uses us. Now, remember in the genealogy, he uses five women. Is that right? Do you remember this? Five women to show you God can use anybody. And it's almost like, oh, I'm, I'm going to pick somebody that you wouldn't expect. And in verse 26 of 1 Corinthians 1, it says, Brothers, consider your calling. Not many are wise from a human perspective, not many powerful, not many of noble birth. Verse 27, instead, God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. Verse 28, God has chosen what is insignificant and despised in the world, what is viewed as nothing, to bring nothing what is viewed as something. And then finally in verse 29, so that no one can boast in his presence. Oh, by the way, John the Baptist, I'm going to put you in the wilderness of Judea so everybody knows it is not about you. It's all about me. Oh, by the way, I want everybody to see that these wise men needed help from people from the Word of God in order to figure this out. They, they didn't have it all figured out. And I think that's the beautiful part about this is that when we do ministry, you guys, when it looks so polished, when you act polished, when you're basically saying it's all about me, I'm, I'm here to tell you it won't last. And it's not about you. It's about Him. So we got to stop what I would say in the church world, faking it. <laughs> Stop faking it like, oh, I have to always do things in the best of the best. Just be like, look, this is all I got. God's called me to the wilderness. I'm going to do my best. Why? So that he gets the glory. John the Baptist goes into the wilderness of Judea. I wonder if he was thinking like, gosh, I sure hope somebody shows up today. And in verse two of Matthew three, here's what he's saying. This is his message. Repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near. You know, this word repent, he's saying, I need you to radically turn from your old way of doing things. I need you to radically change your mind about how you've been doing things. And then I need you to turn your back against that sin. And then I need you to radically run away from that. And then here's the cool thing. You're radically running to the kingdom of heaven. Now, remember in Matthew, in, into the Jews world, they don't like to say the word God. They want to honor and respect God. 
And so instead of the kingdom of God, they're saying the kingdom of heaven. So it has this same feel, the same mentality. And I, I do think this, that as John MacArthur says, that this kingdom is eventually going to be pointing to the hearts of people and how there needs to be an internal repentance. Like John the Baptist is saying, guys, I need you to internal, I need you to start thinking about like, guys, this is real. This is a heart condition. This isn't a legalistic. This isn't a law thing. I need you to begin to change your heart. So this is his message. This is a really, it's a powerful message. And in my mind, I'm thinking, who's even there, right? Like who's even listening? And yet in the process of verse three, now, I do want to say this, the wilderness of Judea, okay, it's obviously on the, on the west side. You're going to have in Qumran, you're going to have some religious folks, the Essenes. Uh, I think I said that right, E-S-S-E-N-E-S. -E -E uh, you know, you're going to have some religious folks there that are going to be a part of the Jewish sect. And I just, I feel like I'm supposed to say this. The Jordan River pours into the Dead Sea. And why, when I was praying through this about why I'm supposed to tell you this phrase, and I think this is a bigger picture, I think there's even songs that sing about this, is that God started an ocean from a river. God started a sea from a river. I'm supposed to say that? Never despise small beginnings. God can use anything to paint a bigger picture. God can use John the Baptist to begin painting a picture of repent, the kingdom of heaven isn't near. We don't know the outcome, our job, we don't know the bigger picture, but our job is just, just to do this. And in verse four, John himself, okay, this is kind of crazy, he, you ready for this, guys? John, okay, we go way back. We, I call him JB. JB, he had, you ready for this? He had a camel hair garment, okay? The guy was extremely fuzzy. And then what he had was that he had a leather belt. Does anybody else find this very interesting, why they describe his clothing? Like, I don't know. You don't ever hear about Matthew, the tax collector, what he's wearing. You don't hear about Peter's outfits. But John the Baptist, a camel hair garment, a leather belt around his waist, and his food, oh yeah, was locusts and wild honey. It could have been, it could have been his bad PR guy describing his clothes. <laughs> I think of Chick-fil-A right now. Like I think of like when you put on chicken biscuits, you put honey on chicken biscuits. I love this. This was probably the, the, the version of Chick-fil-A back then. Can you order locusts on it? What? Locusts? I don't know, but maybe they should consider it. Think about this. In Leviticus 11.22, Kevin, can you go there? Remember, talking about clean and unclean food. Leviticus, we talked about this. You're kind of like, what? why are we studying this? Well, look, John the Baptist actually eats, says this in Leviticus 11.22, you may eat these things. You may eat these. The various kinds of locusts, the various kinds of Katie did, the various kinds of cricket, and the various kinds of grasshopper, and then put in parentheses and cover it with wild honey doesn't say that part covered with wild honey but this is his this is what he's eating and oh by the way John the Baptist you know who he looks like he looks like Elijah Kevin can you go to 2nd Kings 1 8 I think this is really cool so here you have a forerunner Elijah preparing the way but then they kind of it's kind of like they have the same imagery in the Old Testament and in the New Testament in 2nd Kings 1 8 they replied a hairy man with a leather belt around his waist he said it's Elijah the Tishbite so forerunners apparently start growing hair, have a leather belt, start eating locusts and wild honey, and prepare the way. Now, John and Jesus, I want to kind of do a quick comparison as we really, before I begin to get into all this stuff. John the Baptist, I think this is really cool, and Jesus, okay? They both are, I think this is a cool comparison that Nelson's does. They both are agents of God sent by God. Okay, they both serve as an agent. They also have a, a message to proclaim. So John the Baptist, remember this, as a forerunner, he's to reflect what Jesus is going to communicate. That makes sense? He's going to go ahead of what Jesus is going to communicate. So he's an agent. They have the same message. And you should expect they're going to actually experience conflict with Israel. John the Baptist experiences conflict, and so does Jesus. And then at the same time, you know that John the Baptist, guess what? He eventually gets delivered over to who? Over to the Israelites. Guess what? The enemies actually then end up killing John the Baptist. As a forerunner, he prepares the way. Why? Because what happens to Jesus? Jesus as well gets delivered to his enemies. And then in their death, both of them die violently and both of them in a shameful way. Think about all of this. As John the Baptist prepares the way, he's painting a picture. You remember John the Baptist's head gets cut off because of a birthday party. 
literally, because of a birthday party. So all of these forerunner things paint a picture of the coming Messiah. Now, here's what happens in verse five. This is what mind, this is what's mind blowing to me. In the wilderness of Judea, God decides to rally the troops. The PR starts working. Somehow then people from Jerusalem, all Judea and the vicinity of the Jordan were flocking to him. You know, I love, I know we always say this when we travel throughout cities, like if it's a move of God, you don't have to promote it. If it's a move of God, you don't have to advertise or pay for it. You know that, right? We always get accused of, why don't you guys do more radio? Why don't you do more television? I think all those things are absolutely incredible. I have nothing against those. But you shouldn't have to announce, hey, God is moving. Make sure you come check it out. Word will spread. That's what happened with John the Baptist wearing camel clothes, right? Camel hair, eating locusts, eating wild honey, having a leather belt. The guy sounds and probably looks a little off. And yet people were flocking to him. And in verse six, it says, and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. All of these people began coming, all of these areas, they began coming in John's baptist, the baptism. Remember though, it's different than Jesus's baptism. How? How is this different, do you guys think? How is John Baptist baptism different than Jesus's baptism? Any thoughts? Well, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance and uh, the way Jesus, Jesus' baptism represents his death, burial, resurrection. It was just a foreshadow of what's to come. It wasn't the complete picture. Uh, absolutely. And so just to give you a picture of, of kind of the, the bigger picture, um, I love this that remember in the Old Testament, they had purification rituals. Like you had to have a cleansing that, that took place before you could come before the Lord. Before, and, and that's really what this, this repentance, this uh, baptism of repentance is taking place. Now, if you would go to verse seven, when John the Baptist, this is really where it gets fun. Like all these people are coming, right? They're all coming to experience the wilderness of Judea. Hey, did you hear about the revival breaking out? JB is preaching the word and people are repenting and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and they come to the place of his baptism. And he said to them, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Like, why are you here to check this thing out? Are you here just to play the game because everybody else is? And it sounds very similar to language of Jesus. Watch this, Kevin, you go to Matthew 12, verse 34. Here you have Pharisees, here you have Sadducees, the, se the separated ones, those that don't even believe in the resurrection. And, and Matthew 12, verse 34 says, brood of vipers, how can you speak good things when you're evil? For the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. John the Baptist can read these guys like a book and so does Jesus. We know that the heart condition is not of the Lord. They're just here to play the game. They're here to, oh, let's, let's just see what is going on. They're here actually to watch and to test John the Baptist. And here's the craziest thing. This is how we know that the repentance was not legit. Okay, this is gonna sound pretty forward. In verse eight, uh, scripture says this, therefore produce fruit consistent with repentance. In other words, if there is actual legitimate repentance that takes place in the wilderness of Judea and the Pharisees and Sadducees are actually repentant about who they are in this religious act that they, they have, then they should begin to see fruit in their lives. We should begin to see tangible fruit that's taking place because there's a heart condition. There's a change going from one thing to the next. Here's a great picture. 1 Thessalonians 1.9. 1 Thessalonians 1.9 paints this picture of true repentance. For they themselves report about, us, report about us what kind of reception we had from you. How you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, they no longer would be about their, their religion. They'd be about a relationship. They'd no longer be about themselves. They'd actually be about the Lord. And the reality is, is that they're not turning from their idols. They're not turning from their religious duties. They're not turning from, you have to do these things. They're not turning to the living and true God. And John the Baptist just flat out calls them out. I, I think we need more John the Baptist today. I think we need more people just to start calling out the religious cards that are evident across this country. Well, who are you to judge? I'm just saying it's time that we start having the prophets start speaking and releasing the word because if not, people continue to stay in that state of sin and we need a massive revival of repentance. And in verse nine, oh, just because you Pharisees and Sadducees, this is what you're thinking, he says, because you have Abraham as our father, because you come from this religious lineage, 
you think, oh, I'm in. For I tell you that God is able to raise up children for Abraham from these stones. In other words, God doesn't actually need you to show me that you're the lineage of Abraham. God can use children to come from these stones. In other words, I don't really necessarily need you to play the game. I'd love to have been at that conversation in the wilderness. It'd be like the showdown of all showdowns. You know, hairy guy with camel clothes <laughs> and nice looking religious people. And he says, you know what? You can have Abraham, your father. It doesn't mean that you have a relationship with him. And in verse 10, John the Baptist is not done dropping the hammer. He says, even now the ax is ready to strike the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. And you're just like, whoa. In other words, we don't need you. We don't need this. In fact, may the ax come and just strike it at the core because I'm done with this. And the role of a forerunner is to prepare the way for the Messiah. And so as he does, part of the potholes, part of the roads that are bumpy is to get rid of the religious junk so that Jesus can come. So that King Jesus can walk into the role that he's supposed to play. And the forerunner cannot hold back. Sometimes I think that they're forerunners. And so, Lord, I'm just going to ask that you begin to release the forerunners that are even listening right now. Begin to release them from the spirit of fear, maybe begin to function in the fear of God. And that when they function in the fear of God, Lord, I pray that you release a word in their life to begin to break the religious stronghold in this country. God, would you break this so that we can tr truly see a spirit of repentance? And I love what John the Baptist does is he addresses it head on. And he says, I'm done. And in verse 11, watch this. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance. But now look what he says. But the one coming after me, the King Jesus, he's more powerful than I. I'm not even worthy to remove his sandals. I'm, I can't even touch his sandals. He himself, now you ready for this? King Jesus is going to baptize you. And it's the most incredible picture, you guys. King Jesus is going to come and he's going to baptize you with what? The Holy Spirit and fire. In other words, <laughs> Jesus does the baptism this way. And what you have in John the Baptist as Jeff said earlier, he does a baptism of repentance. But this points to Jesus, <laughs> right? Now, I'm just going to tell you, I have, I have grown up in the church all my life. I've gone to seminary a long time. And I never heard a real spot-on message on the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. That's the key. It's kind of like the fire part. You're just kind of like, oh, yeah, fire. And so it's just kind of like we're, we're afraid to go there. We'll talk about, you know, as, as John MacArthur says, we'll talk about the baptism of repentance that, of water. We're talking about the cleansing that John the Baptist does in the wilderness of Judea. But then when we talk about the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, let me just tell you this. I actually believe all of us have been baptized by the Holy Spirit. I believe that. I believe that all of us have been given, you ready for this? The gifts that are inside of us. How much more does our Father want to give His children, you ready for this? The gifts he wants to give all of us these gifts. And when you say yes to the death, burial, and resurrection, when you say, Jesus, I want you to be in charge of my life, then you automatically have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Okay, you have, I believe, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which means you have the gifts inside of you. Okay, you ready for this, right? So you can express at different times, in different places, in different seasons, maybe what we would say the gift of tongues. Maybe the gift of healing. Maybe you're supposed to release the gift of evangelism. The point is, is that I believe all of these gifts come inside of you when you say yes to Jesus. All of them. And in Acts 1, Kevin, if you would, would you just go there, there. Uh, Acts 1, verse 5. Acts 1, verse 5. I'll just talk about the Holy Spirit and then I want to get to the fire part. And if we don't get to anything else, that's okay. John the Baptist is a forerunner and he says, oh, by the way, King Jesus is coming and he's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit and the fire. I'm just the repentance side, but there's so much more. And I think sometimes the church, we just, we stay stuck in the spirit of repentance, but we never allow the Holy Spirit to take over so that the fire of God can refine us. In Acts 1, 5, it says, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And then in verse 8, Remember, Jesus then says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. You will receive power. Why? You will receive these gifts so that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, Samaria 
and to the ends of the earth. You are going to receive the Holy Spirit. Why? So that all of these gifts serve as you being his witness. Can I just say this? As a forerunner for the coming of the Messiah. So John the Baptist prepares the way, right? So Jesus could come the first time. And then our job is to be his witnesses. We've been empowered by the Holy Spirit, what? To be the forerunner for the coming of the Messiah, for the return of the Messiah. Does that make sense? John the Baptist says the first time, our job is to get ready for the second time. And the way we get ready is that we recognize we've been baptized by the Holy Spirit and the fire. Now these gifts, I believe, cannot keep coming out. I believe God has to keep refining the junk inside of us so that the gifts can be expressed. That's where I believe the fire comes into play. Now think about this, Kevin, if you can. We go to Leviticus 6, verse 13. Go to Leviticus 6, verse 13. It says, the fire must be kept burning on the altar continually. Okay? In the presence of God, the fire will not go out. It must not go out. For me to tell you, once you receive the Holy Spirit, and it says you've been baptized by fire, for me to tell you that the fire goes out, that would be the most unbiblical thing ever. The fire of God inside of you. You've been baptized by fire. Why? This is so cool to me, you guys. Look at what John the Baptist, watch in verse 12 of Matthew 3. It says, okay, so you've been baptized with fire in the Holy Spirit. His winnowing shovel is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor and, and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn up with fire that never goes out. So there's a fire inside of you that never goes out. The baptism of the fire is to burn away the chaff that's inside of you so that you can express the Holy Spirit in your everyday life. Why? So that you can be a forerunner for the return of the Messiah. Now, when I say chaff to you guys, okay, I'll address it in my life. What is the chaff in your life that you would say, I need continually being burned up in my life? What would you say? Any initial thoughts? Just selfishness, the, the tendency to think of ourselves before others. So let's use that as an example, because I think it applies to all of us. If we're allowing the fire to burn the selfishness inside of us, what does that free us up to do? To think of others, love others. Love others. It should always, this burning, this baptism of the fire should always, always, always point us to him and to others. Kevin, what would be a chaff, some chaff in your life that you would say? Um, just... Focusing on the wrong things. So just distractions. So the chaff can do that. Now, you guys, I think this is really important. If you never understand that the fire of God that is inside of you that never goes out, if you never understand that it's burning away the chaff, guess what? I believe we never address the issues in our life. So then you know what happens? We become the religious again. We become those that say we're going to repent. But when we don't allow the fire of God to start burning away these things, fruit never happens which then shows us repentance never really happened. I don't know, Rich, you want to add anything to the chaff in your life? You just couldn't keep going, could you? <laughs> just had to go one more. <laughs> uh, mine would probably just be frustration, anger. And so when the fire, the baptism of fire that Jesus, King Jesus gives us, not only does he burn away that anger, not only does he burn away that frustration, and then he replaces it with peace. Then he gives us patience. But none of that is expressed unless we allow him to do that in our lives. And so I think that we can learn from John the Baptist. And he's saying, hey, by the way, Jesus is going to do this. I just think we're so afraid. Like, I think what we've done with this baptism of fire, you know what we always do, honestly? We think it's the tongues that's above our head. That's what a lot of people attribute this to. They say, oh, we've been baptized with the Holy Spirit and then we have the baptism of fire that's always above our head. You guys, it's talking about burning the things that's within us so that we can express the gifts. Why? So that we can serve as a forerunner for the coming Messiah. Don't make this harder than what it is. And that's what happened to the religious. When the religious started equating truth and tradition, they got messed up. They confused everything. Was this truth or is this tradition? If we're not careful in the American church, well, no, I can't talk about the baptism of the fire. That, that cannot be of the Lord. Then you don't even go there to hear what truth is. But we need John the Baptist to say, stop with that nonsense. Forget some of this oral traditions and you search the word of God for what it says. You search if the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the fire, if what we taught, if, if you search this. Is, this. is this in line with what we're talking about? I'm telling you guys, if this points us to serving as a witness, which points us to getting ready for the return, praise the Lord. 
In verse 13, once John the Baptist releases this words to the religious, it says in verse 13, then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. Remember, John the Baptist didn't even feel like he could touch his sandals. <laughs> and now John said, no, 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 no. I need to be baptized by you in verse 14. And yet you come, you come to me and Jesus says in verse 15, uh, allow it for now because this is the way for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed Jesus, John the Baptist allowed Jesus to be baptized. I know we're running short on time, but I do think this is important. Jesus actually got water baptized, okay? I don't care, you guys, if you do water on your head, if you do sprinkle. I mean, what Jesus did, just to point it out, he went all in. I mean, that's kind of an obvious. He got all in, got all wet. I don't know why we wouldn't model how Christ did it, but I'm not stuck on the, the differences. But I wanted to say this, why is this important for us to see? Four things that Nelson says. One is, is it pictures Jesus' baptism, it pictures death and resurrection. It also pictures and pref, uh, prefigures the significance. If Christ was baptized, then we should as well. Okay, now, I wanted to say, somebody that's listening here, you've been a believer all your life, you've never been baptized, I would say now is probably the time. Oh, but I gotta wait for my great aunt to come into town for our family reunion. I've heard all kinds of excuses why, just get baptized. Just get baptized. And then the third point that Nelson says is that, this is kind of cool, it marks Jesus' first public identification with those whose sins he would bear. Jesus says, I'm, I'm in, and I want you to do what I'm doing. And then finally, I think this is kind of cool, it affirms the, uh, I always get this phrasing weird, the Messiahship. It affirms him being the Messiah publicly by, by the testimony directly from heaven, right? Because you know then in verse 16, it says, after Jesus was baptized, he went immediately from the water. The heaven suddenly opened up for him. And then he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove coming down on him. Now watch this in verse 17. And there came a voice from heaven. This is my beloved son. I take delight in him. So you see in the story of Matthew 3, John the Baptist's obedience to serve as a forerunner. He points to us and says, guys, Jesus is gonna baptize us in the spirit of God and with fire. And then it gives us a model of really, we should be baptized as well. Now there's three instances that Jesus actually has an interaction with the voice from heaven in this time. One is, is that we see Warren Wiersbe says in Christ's baptism. Two, we see in Matthew 17, the Mount Transfiguration. And then three in John, it says, as Christ approached the cross. This is cool to me and this is how I wanna close. What I love what Wiersbe said is said, in the past, God spoke to his son. We see that. But now Jesus, who's sitting at the right hand of the Father, today God is speaking through His Son to us. And I think to me it's an incredible picture. If you want to get in tune with the Lord, it's no longer about religious rituals. It's about coming to the Son who is sitting next to the Father. And all of it starts from is obedience. Is the Lord asking me to turn to Him in obedience. John the Baptist did it and it didn't make sense. Some of you are being asked to turn to the Lord. It's not going to make sense, but I would just say do it because that's how the Father speaks to us today. It's through His Son. All right, Matthew 1, 2, and 3. There's more there. I get it. But there's always just a beginning to scratch the surface about who King Jesus is in the Gospel of Matthew. Thanks.